This next group of women exemplify the change we want to see in the world. Three powerhouse studio professionals leading the way for the next generation of talent through their excellence and expertise. Ivana Manley, Hyper Payne, and Ebony Smith. Together with Senior Managing Director of the Recording Academy's Producers and Engineers Wing and former recording engineer herself, Maureen Droney. Thank you, Roxy. I'm going to introduce these ladies. Ebony Smith is an award-winning music producer, audio engineer, and singer-songwriter based in New York City and Memphis. She's worked on Grammy Award-nominated and winning projects, including the Hamilton original Broadway cast recording, Sturgill Simpson's A Sailor's Guide to Earth, Dirty Computer by Janelle Monet, and Invasion to Privacy by Cardi B. Ebony is also the founder and president of Gender Amplified, an organization that celebrates and supports women and girls in music, production, and audio engineering. Piper Payne is a mastering engineer based in Nashville, where she works on albums for both independent artists and major labels at Infrasonic Mastering. She's currently a Recording Academy trustee, as well as co-chair of the Producers and Engineers Wing. She's a founder and chair of the Audio Engineering Society's Diversity and Inclusion Committee, as well as an active member of both Women's Audio Mission and the board of soundgirls.org. Ivana Manley was building tube amplifiers while still in college at Columbia University. By the time she and David Manley formed Manley Laboratories in 1993, Ivana was managing the entire factory in charge of purchasing and building international dealer networks for both audiophile and pro audio customers. By the late 1990s, Ivana took over engineering management and new product creation. Now president of the company, her flair for artistic expression can be seen with her first two solo projects, the Manly Vox Box and Stingray, which are still in production today and have sold thousands of units worldwide. Before I ask my questions, I want to say something I've observed about these three women and something I love and admire about them. It's that they show up. They show up for our industry. They're all busy, but they make the time to come to meetings, to understand the issues, and to work to solve them. Whether it's proper crediting and attribution for creators, or how to get music to listeners sounding like the artists who created it intended it to sound. They're informed about the challenges we face, and they give their time and their energy towards making things better. These ladies bring it. My first question for them is, what got you interested in audio engineering as a career? And I think I'm going to start with Piper. All right. Hey there. Hi, Maureen. Thanks very much for that. Um, well, it's it's quite an honor to uh, to be able to talk about this here today. Um, I'm I thinking back to the where I got started in audio and what was that spark for me was when I was in jazz band uh, in high school as a drummer, and uh, we were playing some Buddy Rich uh, music uh, in big band. And, uh, and I could not figure out why these recordings that I listened to to learn the Buddy Rich solos sounded so different than the recordings of what we got back from the, the uh, CD of the band concert a couple of weeks later. And I think that partially it might have been my playing. I'm not quite as good of a drummer as Buddy Rich was, <laughs> not but I think I'm are. a nicer person. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I, I actually started thinking about this a lot. Why does this thing sound this way from ages ago and it sounds incredible and we have this modern technology in theory, digital recordings and we can't, and it doesn't sound that good. And of course I now know that it has to do so much with the source and the placement and you know proper production and all that stuff. But that was really the inception for me um, to, get in, to get really interested in going beyond being a musician. I eventually went to school for electrical engineering and then found that there was a way to blend and my passion of audio, um, music, um, and engineering into this thing called recording and, and audio engineering. And eventually I, I ended up becoming a mastering engineer, but that was the inception for me it was just curiosity and, uh, and not being afraid to ask questions. So why didn't it sound like you expected it to, or how, how it sounded to you when you were in the band? Um, 
because we were a bunch of high school chess. Oh no, no, not people. why. But 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 that was the reason. That's what got that's what got you into it was Yeah, was that was the reason. Having yes. expectations of how it yeah. would sound. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I I had yeah, exactly. I had an expectation of what I thought it should sound like and it didn't. And so why is that? And then that is just what got me started and now, you know, what? Just a few years later, here I am talking to you. <laughs> How about you, Ebony? What started you? So, well, for me, I was always a musician. So that started very early with church and growing up in Memphis, Tennessee, where music is a religion. So, but it was in high school, actually. I went to a local music shop here called Strings and Things, which was the predecessor to a guitar center. And all of the keyboards were laid out. There was a drum section. There was a guitar section. And being a piano player, I made my way to the keyboard section. And there was a clerk who was demoing the new rolling keyboards. And at the time, you see a keyboard and you think it's just uh, an electric piano was what I thought it, it was. But it was actually one of the early keyboard workstations. Uh, digital workstations. It actually had an onboard DSP. And so he started demoing it in front of me and it had this onboard sequencer. And I said, okay, he layered one song, one sound, he layered another sound and he layered something else. And before I knew it, he'd remade one of the songs that I heard on the radio, one of my favorite songs. And I was like, wow, this thing is a, he, he's a band in a box. He's, he's figured out a way to be the whole band. And all I need to do is get $3,000 to buy this box keyboard magical instrument and all will be right with the world. And I, and I can sound like the radio and I, and I can be the radio at home by myself in the privacy of my own home. So I went over to my mom and I was like, hey, for $3,000, I can be a one person band. And she was just like, no, I don't have that kind of money. Uh, she thought about it though. She thought about financing it, but I left home. I mean, I went home that day without that, that sequencer. And I realized that if I was going to ever have it, I would have to figure out how to buy it. <laughs> and I would have to uh, start along that path. So that was the beginning of it. and. Little by little, I saved up until I bought my own. But I think I'm pretty sure that was the genesis of it all was in that key in that keyboard shop that day of of seeing the possibilities. And, and I didn't have the terminology for a producer or engineer. I didn't know anything about that. It was really me following that initial uh, instinct to be the one woman band. Ivana? Yeah, I, I started off as a big old band geek in high school as well. I went to college and studied music and ma basically music theory because I, I wasn't that good a saxophone player. You know, I was okay, but not not like uh, world class. Um, so I got uneasy in school and I felt this desire to not, to definitely not graduate without knowing where I was going. So I got inspired one day in class when a really famous um, concert promoter named Bill Graham, who started the whole San Francisco music scene, basically, um, his son was in my class and he came to teach that day and he was explaining the music industry to us, you know, the artist, the producer, the engineer, the concert promoter, and I'm like, oh wow, that all sounds exciting. I knew nothing about recording, nothing. So I... That coupled with my need to earn some money to be able to pay for the rest of my college education led me to California to go get a job for like six or nine months and figure it all out. So I initially intended to go to San Francisco and find Bill Graham, but I stopped in Los Angeles and um, my dad, here's the other part of the story, my stepfather had owned Ampeg in the late 60s. So he, uh, so I kind of knew about manufacturing a little bit. He wasn't doing that stuff, uh, you know, after he met my mom and all. He had sold Ampeg before all that happened. But um, anyway, he gave me a couple contacts of some ex-employees. And one of them 
the first guy didn't pick up the phone. This is in 1989, so we had no smartphones or anything like that. The second guy was at Fender, and he talked with me and uh, told me to contact these two crazy South Africans building tube amplifiers out in Chino, California. And I'm like, that sounds weird, but I'll try. And I met David and Luke Manley and uh, started on the production line of uh, building electronics, building vacuum tube amplifiers. And I swear to God, when I walked in that in that factory, I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. I'm like, what are those things over there? And they're like, those are two monoblocks. I'm like, what is that? Is that like a receiver? And they're like, yeah, kind of. That's the amplifier part. I'm like, okay. So really, I started knowing nothing, and I started on the ground floor and uh, just worked my way up over the years and gained knowledge by just doing stuff and getting technical and learning how electronics work and so on. And because I'm kind of pigeonholed in the vacuum tube area, you know, that it wasn't something I could go back and study in college. So I had to learn on the job, basically. So I did go back and finish my degree, and I've, I've been back out here in California building tube gear ever since. Did you ever meet Bill Graham? I, I didn't after that class, no, and I wasn't able to thank him for the inspiration before he tragically died in the helicopter. Yeah, I knew him, and, and you and he would have really hit it off. <laughs> I know. I've had a lot of people tell me that, but he was a huge inspiration, and that's that's the point of my story is like, keep your eye out there. There could be those pivotal moments in your day, like today that could just change the whole course of your life. So be receptive to that. What have you learned along the way in your careers, which have had a lot of twists and turns? You're all also uh, hybrids, you know, in the things that you do. Music musician yourself and player and producer and engineer and entrepreneurs. Um, so you've learned a lot. And what are things that you'd like the people watching that you'd like to share with them about things you've learned over the years? I've learned a great many things. Uh, the first is that there's no such thing as mastering production and engineering. I like to say all the time, I am neck deep in engineering and production with about 15 years of experience now. And I'm nowhere because the field is like the ocean and I'm neck deep. So there's so much more to learn. And that's what excites me the most and is the curiosity behind the music making process that keeps me inspired and engaged every day. And so that that's the, the driving force because you're never going to master it. it. It kicks my butt every day. I'm in the studio. It kicks, kicks my butt. I'm heading there as soon as I leave here and I love it and I'm passionate about it. So I think as far as what to distill from that, it's that um, it's such a wonderful journey and it's not necessarily about the end result because you're, you'll never master it, but it's about all the wonderful things that you learn over the process of um, learning the technology and, and finding your artistic voice through the study of the technology. I think about that sometimes, how lucky we are to, is it, to work in jobs that we really love. It's so important if you're gonna work. It's, imagine if you had to work at something you hated. You know, right. and, and when you're working on music and learning all the time and working with people who make music, you know, it's just, it's a good life. <laughs> yes, yes. Piper, some sharing from you about um, what you'd like people to know you learned along the way. Yeah. Um, well, the, the biggest thing that comes to mind is just be honest about where you're at and do your very best and mm. try and find those folks out there that care about you and that want you to succeed. And I have staring at three of them right here. And, um, and those, those people along the way that you meet, they're going to be the ones that you're going to help out along the way sometimes, and they're going to help you out along the way sometimes. And so as long as you can just be as open and honest about about what you know and what you don't, you'll be fine um, because people are here in this industry to help you and to take to you know 
as long as you're helping yourself, you will always have someone helping you, helping you out too. Um, and the other thing too goes along with that is work, work as hard as you can always, mm -hmm. because even if you don't, you know, like you ha either have time, talent or skills, right? And if you have even one of those things, you can make, you can make up for the other two that you don't have. And, um, and, but you have to, you have to be a well-rounded person to make it in this industry. So um, that, and make sure that you protect your reputation as much as possible, mm. because that is you, that's your brand, that's your future work. And, um, and so if you always, always just try and, and, and do that, do your very best, be honest about where you're at, take care of the people that take care of you. And then just watch your, you know, watch your reputation because that's your calling card. You'll be fine. It's going to be all right. I think one of the great things about being in the audio industry for me is that drive for excellence that everybody has, you know, the people that make the gear, the people that are the engineers. I mean, just there's, there's really no slacking off in that. It's, it's a constant endeavor to be great mm -hmm. and, and to make great recordings and, that's not a bad thing to spend your life doing. You know, sometimes we start off with like some kind of idea like, oh, okay, I'm going to go uh, work for Bill Graham and be so do something in live sound. Okay. That was my initial idea. And then I took another direction. But what I've learned is we, you know, it doesn't matter. There's so many different pockets in the recording industry that we all can get into. You know, you could be a recording engineer or a mastering engineer, or you could, you could be a, a lawyer who deals with issues in the entertainment business, or you could be a geeky manufacturer like me or whatever. At the end of the day, we all get to hang out with our favorite music geeky people <laughs> who we are and we all love. So, and I, the camaraderie yes. in the industry, I think is, is just so wonderful and it's definitely uh, to keep fostering that is it is a motivating factor why I show up definitely because you all mean so much to me all my best friends are right here in the recording world you know and um it it keeps us human and keeps us connected which music does you know I love that Ebony tell us about Gender Amplified your organization your your charity that you founded Gender Amplified started as my senior thesis project while I was at Barnard and which is a part of uh, Columbia University in New York and basically I was curious about the existence of women in music production uh, and specifically working in hip hop because at that time I was starting to get very interested in exploring a career in production, but I didn't see peers. And I was very curious about whether or not there are women in the space, because for the longest time, I thought I was the only woman producing music in the world. And, you know, I got into Barnard, so clearly I have some sense, and that did not sound sensical. And I was like, that just doesn't, that doesn't sound right, that I would be the only one in the world so I started looking for them actively and Googling and, you know, through word of mouth and going to beat making competitions and things like that. I started to identify this very small community of women who are out there working in hip hop, who are making beats, some of whom had made considerable inroads into the music business. And so I decided to do my ethnography around those women. And that was the beginning. That was 2007. And I did a compliment to my senior thesis project, which was a conference on campus the same year I was graduating that brought all the women to campus for a day long festival and conference, which was um, the keynote address was by Trisha Rose, whose research had actually motivated me to form organi and organize around women in music production because that was one of her calls to action in her book was that if more women wanted to work as a community and build out space, they would have to actually initiate that movement. So she came to campus as the keynote and all the women in my uh, senior thesis project came to campus and the power of that day always stuck with me. There was something very special that converged that day on campus 
And I just remembered how that felt. And so as I continued to make inroads into the business as an engineer and intern, I continued to do smaller events, a lot of times still partnering with Barnard. Um, we did panels, music festivals, we did workshops um, and continue to live in the spirit of that community, building grassroots organizing. And eventually just one thing led to another and we founded a charity, a nonprofit with some of my professors from Barnard, as well as some colleagues. And now we have partnerships all across the music and tech worlds. And it's been really great to see it grow over the years. And the biggest thing is, even though for me, we've heard very much spoken about the disparities in with respect to gender parity in music production and studio culture, um, which is certainly an issue that the music industry is grappling with. And uh, socially and culturally, we tr we're trying to grapple with with respect to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But at the same time, the, the angle that Gender Amplified approaches our mission from is, is one that is dealing with celebrating the art form, celebrating the craft, and using what we do as a charity as a means of allowing women and girls to collide with the art form, because that in and of itself is its own reward. It's great if young women and girls can be aspiring to be in the music business and entertainment spaces and working professionally in audio, but in the event that they don't, even if they're just engaging as a hobbyist or uh, just a, a creative that is using the medium of music production as a means of self-expression, that's still very liberating, cathartic, therapeutic, and very important with respect to just personal expression. So I, I believe that it is important to celebrate women in music production and also to provide a, a means for the craft to be explored. So that's a little bit of what we do. And we reach our mission through our live events and most of which have been virtual within the last year. Uh, but we run production camps, panels, workshops. And we also have original virtual content that we've been making over the last year um, that I'm really proud of as well. So um, that's a little bit about us and what we do. And you can check us out at genderamplified.org. And Piper, um, you're part of at least two organizations, um, the AES's Diversity and Inclusion um, Committee group, mm -hmm. and and also soundgirls.org on the board. Mm -hmm. Any comments to add to Ebony's about what those groups do and how they help? Yeah, um, the the Audio Engineering Society, uh, just a few years ago, we we had the first ever effort towards uh, gender, uh, something approaching gender parity, hopefully one day. Um, and of course, more diverse um, backgrounds from genre to ethnicity to geography, um, age, every, everything you can think of, the AES at the time was uh, kind of missing it. And we're really starting to see a turnaround now that the board ratified us as a proper committee. And I was able to work with my co-chair, Leslie Gaston Bird, um, my partner in crime in that one. Um, and we are finally starting to see some real change happening at the AES. So I'm happy to report there, there's more stuff coming on the horizon. This was just recently one of the most diverse AES uh, conferences that's ever, uh, I think probably the most diverse that's ever happened. Um, and then soundgirls.org is just an incredible networking community and events uh, community for women in music. And it's very supportive. A lot of people find opportunities for work through that. And of course, um, being connected to other incredible women in, in the audio industry. And so I'm very proud to, uh, to spend time with both organizations. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, diversity inclusion work group now uh, has a couple of brand new co-chairs that are just, uh, I'm just transitioning out of um, being that leader for the last almost five years. And so I'm really, really happy to see this little baby bird fly um, up into the world. And so um, it's, it's pretty cool to, to feel like it's, it's in good hands and I can let go of it finally and, uh, and move on to my next endeavors. Well, I think we're out of time. So thanks to everyone who's watching and I hope this has been interesting and helpful for you. Thank you, Bye. Mary. Thank you.